I am uh, excited today uh, to talk about um, to talk about what finishing up our brief overview of this week of the book of Ephesians. Tonight, what we're going to do, um, we're going to dive into basically the last four chapters of, uh, for our midweek, um, for uh, uh, last three chapters, rather, of the book of Ephesians. And so we've talked about before, it's a well-known fact that the first book, of, first three books of Ephesians is uh, about what it's like to be in Christ, what it's like to become a Christian, what it's like um, to be in union with Christ. Uh, one of the um, favorite phraseologies that Paul has is to being in Christ, especially in the book of Ephesians. And so um, we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a second. And, um, and I'm going to go ahead and ask um, that that we read um, verse 1 through 10. We'll go ahead and look at that uh, for a second. And, and I want you to note um, the frequency with which Paul writes this idea of being in union with Christ. Of course, the Bible tells us that the way we get in Christ, the way we get unionized with Christ is when we get baptized into Christ. And so Paul writes and he helps us to understand what it's like to be in Christ. And so actually he even begins. And so this is what he says in uh, chapter one, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so you'll see that quite a few times. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so he goes on to talk about uh, what it's like to be in Christ. So every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he, destined, he chose us in him, and we'll see he mentions that twice, that uh, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption uh, to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He talks about having redemption in Christ. He talks about receiving every spiritual blessing in Christ. He says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished in us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment to, un to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose and will. And, sorry, and then he says in verse 13, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And Paul goes on to, to really write um, in a remarkable fashion all these ideas of what it's like to be in Christ, that uh, we, are, we have become the faithful ones in Christ. Uh, let me review here. We've received every spiritual blessing in Christ. We were chosen in him. We were adopted in him. We have redemption in him. We have this inheritance in him, in Christ. Christ is bringing the entire universe to its fulfillment. Um, and then he says for, that God is exercising his mighty power for, uh, for us who believe in him. In him, you were dead in your transgressions. Uh, 
you who are dead in your transgressions have been made alive in him. You, we have been created for good works. In him, we who are far away have been brought near. In him, long enemies who can come together in Christ. In him, we are being built together uh, to become a dwelling place for God. And, and the whole idea that Paul writes there, I mean, it's just marinated in this idea. And that's why he begins the book and he talks about what it's like to be in Christ. And the book is just filled with theology. Some argue that it's perhaps on an overall basis, it covers deep theological things that is book written in the book of Ephesians. And then what, uh, and then tonight we're going to examine, okay, what does it mean that all these things, like what, what does it really, really mean? What should we do with it? Or the big so what? So what all these things? Why have I spent the last couple of weeks inundating us with this idea who we are and whose we are? What is the practical application of this? Very, very, very important. And, you know, it's, it's just really, really important that we understand who we are, that we claim exactly who we are. And Paul sums up the entire uh, first three chapters beautifully. I mean, absolutely remarkably. And he says this in chapter three, the first <clears throat> section. He has, a, he has a, basically a, a, a beautiful poetic way that he sums it all up uh, in verse, started with a great grand prayer. He talks about the fact that we require supernatural um, understanding, uh, an awakening to understand what indeed we have in Christ and to understand how much God truly loves us. And to know that this love really it's, it's not possible to know all the love. I don't know about you, but, you know, when, when, if you have children, we used to tell the kids how much we love them. And, and uh, when they were really, really young, they loved that. When they got uh, teenagers, they didn't, they thought, ooh, ooh. And then when they get older again, it, it, they love it again. And, uh, and, and so this is this real cycle of thing. And, and, and it's hard sometimes to express. And that's what Paul's writing. He says, I can't, words can't even express. You can't even conceptualize how much God loves you. And then he says in verse 20, all these things that we have in Christ. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Now, this is what God is able to do. Immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. I remember, and I, I, I remember, this is now 34 years later. Clovis, who helped me to become a Christian, Clovis wrote me a card, and it was a Christmas card, in my first year in 1986 talking about our relationship and talking about um, how much he appreciates me. And, I'll, and this is what he says. He said, Tony, do you realize the limiting factor to what God can do in your life is tied to your imagination? Imagine. If you can imagine it, 
God can do more than that. That's what he says. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. This is not about me having money or, in, or uh, 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 academic prowess. But the idea of what God can do in your life, what God can do with the COVID-19, what God can do with the racial tensions, what God can do. is only limited by our imagination, by what we can think, by what we can dream, by some would argue, by what we can believe, what we can have faith about. But being in Christ, and Paul says, I want you to understand this amazing, amazing thing. All that we have in Christ, all that we have been redeemed from and been washed from and been pulled away from. And so this morning, this idea of what we can do in Christ is just an amazing thing. And so this morning, can you imagine what God can do with your life? No, really imagine it. What could he use you to do? with his power at work, not about our ability. That's not what it says. It's about his power at work in us because of who we are and whose we are. Is it a dream for our families to be reconciled to Christ? Is that too lofty a dream? Well, God has the power to do that. There's no one who's too far gone that God's long arms can't reach. But sometimes, even for me to imagine, that I am not too far gone. That I have not strayed so far. There are times I have discussions with people and with disciples who wonder, is God done with them? Is their usefulness over with? Are they being just put out to pasture, waiting to die? Am I in a retirement home that my kids have put me off in? And so this morning, Paul grasped and he says, I want, I am kneeling and I am praying to God that you grasp how long and high and wide the love that God has for us and to realize his power is at work in us and that our, his ability to work in our lives is not limited by his power but it's limited by our imagination. So this morning, I want you to think about this day. What can God do with you? I love it. I love the fact that one of the reasons why we moved to Canada is that Canada was a land of opportunity. That that you could do, as the old adage goes, you can do whatever you want. Of course, people use that to the nth degree, but whatever. But you can do whatever you want. That there's this dream, that the, there is this love 
of whatever you can be, you want to be, you can become. Where we were, we were limited by really honestly only going up to high school from an education vantage point. The college was non-existent, the university was non-existent. And that everybody who, who became something, so to speak, who got themselves out of the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, had to go to other places to quote unquote, better themselves. And then there were people in communities who never even saw themselves as getting out of there. Their main goal in life was pure survival. God says in Christ, with all these things and who we are and whose we are, it's not about survival. It's about imagination. That's what Disney has built its empire on. Truthfully, it's imagine. And they're only talking about imagine things on this earth. God says in the heavenly realms, his power is at work within us. That God even wants to use me. Some of the things that, that just is remarkable that we get to do, we get to be part of a process in changing people's eternal address. Some of people's goals is to, is to go move out of the community that they're in and move to a better community, whatever that means. We get to change people's, to be a part of the process to help to change people's eternal address. That we don't have to be imprisoned with thoughts anymore. And so dream this morning, dream today, dream about what God can do through your life. God's ability to work in your life sometimes is limited only by our imagination and our ask. Man, and I feel, especially in this day and age, that there needs to be a caveat that, that God is not a cosmic bellhop. He's not an investment plan. That's not what we're talking about here. You read the New Testament, you realize that's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about things of substance to change your own life, to have vision to help other people's lives change with joy and peace and self-control and gentleness and love, the ability to love and the ability to be loved, the ability to forgive. If we're gonna move on as a community, as a nation, as a continent, as a society, from the ills that have hurt us, we're gonna to have to know how to forgive. We're gonna to have to have the ability to forgive for there to be true reconciliation. And God paved the way for us when we have hurt him, how he forgave us. That's a hard thing. The more someone has hurt you, the harder it is to forgive. The more someone is close to you who have hurt you, it's hard to forgive because your expectations were so high of them. That's why it's hard sometimes for children to forgive their parents uh, when they've been molested or hurt or been abused or when a spouse is an inability to forgive their other spouse because of abuse. Or in this case, where races have hurt other races for generations and generations and generations. And one race can't hear the other race in talking about, wait, wait a minute, I didn't do this. Why are you blaming me? And the other generation, uh, race is saying, well, 
you're part of that. You've, you've received part of that for so many years, but we can't hear each other. And unless we hear each other, we cannot forgive each other. The world peace is actually possible. That's what Ephesians talks about. In Christ, that he was able to break down the wall of hostility. If there's a message that's prevalent for us today that gives us unbelievable hope, it's the message of the cross. And just like how we had to approach the throne of God with humility, that's the way we have to treat one another. We have the answers. That unbelievable solution to world peace, yes, that big question is found in the book of Ephesians. That solution to solve world hunger is in is in the gospel. That's what this imagination and the power of the gospel is. And so we think about that this morning. We Christians, as nutty as we may be, never lose hope for anyone's heart to change. I've talked to people and they say, well, they will never change. If you don't believe that, you don't believe in Christ. You don't believe in his power. If you don't believe we can solve world peace, if you don't believe that, you haven't understood Ephesians 3. If you don't believe we personally can change, if we don't believe what we have, we don't understand what we have in Christ. There's this hope that what it does for us. And then he talks about some things. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. We'll do an overview. There's some things that he says, now that we understand all these things in Christ. And so for the last few weeks, and that's why sometimes it's really, really important that uh, we don't take just one message and say, that's what I'm going to eat. You know, there's a reason why there are 66 books that we have there that we look at. We can't cover it all in one book or in one sitting. But it's for us to keep eating and keep chewing and keep nourishing ourselves. And the last couple of weeks has been nourishing ourselves on what we have in Christ because of Christ being unionized with Christ, the power that's available for us in Christ. And now where we can forgive one another. We don't have to live in fear because of this quarantine. We don't have to live in fear because of this coronavirus. That we don't have to not only be imprisoned with a mentality, but even in our minds be living in fear. Not that we need to be reckless, that's what no one's talking about that. But it actually squeezes out even our lives. What uh, we started doing here in the West because of, because of the COVID-19 and Ontario says, well, we could, we could gather together. The brothers got together just in the West, those who can make it and those who feel comfortable with it. We have what we call Monday night musings. And so we sit in the backyard, six feet apart, chairs all about, and we just talk about our lives share we miss that i mean we can talk on on this and and sometimes guys have hard time zooming in each other we got to see each other you know um and stare at each other but we just started that 
and there were a few of us that came and we just, it was just great to be with each other. We're not going to be imprisoned in our minds, living in fear, but we're going to have an imagination and be asking God and watch God work in our lives. It is my absolute, absolute belief that we can this that we can change the world and the racial tension. If I don't believe that, I don't believe in Christ. And I'm talking that for me. I'm not making a I'm not making a comment about your faith or whether or not you believe that and I'm making saying you're not a Christian. I'm talking the power of Christ. So this morning, whenever you go to Disney World, they talk to you about your imagination. That's not about flying through on a magic carpet or, or, or Tinkerbell flying. That's not what we're talking about or just looking at the unbelievable Epcot place or the, or the majestic fireworks or Animal Kingdom or, or the amazing water parks. And so it's just come here for the week, they say, and just just let your imagination fly and enjoy the place. And what do they call it? What? The happiest place on earth. And I appreciate what Walt Disney has done. And there's, I mean, uh, just unbelievable big people travel from all over the world to go to these places. Bill Gates had an imagination when he was, when he was, uh, writing pro computer programs that there will be a desktop in every person's home. Some of our homes in North America have two, three, four desktops or at least iPads or laptop. He now doesn't have that dream anymore. And they're working on, of course, in, in underdeveloped countries to be able, in developing countries to be able to do that. He's moved on. So a different dream. But those are human dreams. We have dreams that God can work in our life. And I know I repeated myself because I wanted to get in there. Dream and imagine what God can do. And it's only limited by our ability to dream and our ability to ask. That's what it means to be in Christ. Amen. What a beautiful thought we're going to have today about, uh, about what we can do. Uh, I'm so excited. We're going to be able to have our staff meeting here in, in, um, in Ottawa with the interns. We look forward to having a great and productive day as, as uh, these, uh, these young fellas and young fellettes are, are just really thrilled about uh, serving God in this capacity. So I pray that you have a great day um, and that we're going to be so very, very encouraged in our heart. Let's close with a prayer here. It's already 8.31. I didn't realize that. Wow. Amen. Let's pray. Father, it is my prayer, as it was Paul's prayer, that our hearts understand what we have in you and who we have in you and what we have become in you, and who we have become in you, and whose we are in you. It is staggering to think this God of the universe has implanted himself in us and has empowered us to do things of, that are so meaningful, that is only limited by our imagination. And Father, that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened to grasp who you are, your immensity, your enormity, your magnificence, your power, your strength, your wisdom, your glory, your joy, your mercy, your grace, these things that are boundless and limitless, help us to grasp these.
these things, but they surpass knowledge. Help us to understand who they are. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the technology that we have. Above all else, we are grateful for Christ. We're grateful for his death because it meant life for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.